As you know, uh, on Communion Sundays, I promise that I will be doing a series I call Words of Our Salvation. And this is part number seven of Words of Our Salvation. And I'm dealing with the subtitle, Righteousness. Righteousness. In part one, if you remember, we considered the term born again. Then we looked at redemption, we looked at new creation, we looked at justification, sanctification. Last month we looked at atonement, and today we are looking at righteousness. These are very important words or topics related to our salvation, and it's important as Christians for us to be very grounded in our faith that we don't just believe God for breakthroughs and miracles, but we know the foundation on which God ministers to us and blesses us. And righteousness is one of those. So uh, let's start with the question, what is righteousness? What does it mean? And uh, it means many things, but I'm just going to use two definitions to express what righteousness means. Uh, it means to be examined by God and found to be right. To be examined by God and found to be right or found to be in order. So when we say that a person or something is righteous, it means that it has met God's standards. God has examined that thing or person and pronounced it right or in order. So righteousness is very important. Uh, it is similar to what happened in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when a sacrifice was to be made, the animal would be presented to the priest. Uh, whether it was a goat or a lamb or a bull, it would be presented to the priest. And the priest had to examine the animal because God had specifications for animals that were brought for sacrifice, the age, the size, uh, how it looked. So the priest then would start checking from the head. Uh, if he didn't have to have a spot, he has to look everywhere and ensure that there is no spot. Uh, if it has to be in a certain shape, the priest will then examine every part of the, of the animal. And if he didn't find any blemish, he would say, this animal is fit to be sacrificed. It, in other words, it has met the standard. And that's what righteousness is. God examines us and then he says, you are okay. You are good. You've met the standard. So that is... Uh, the first definition of righteousness. So that makes righteousness both legal and moral. So it, it meets a certain standard. Secondly, righteousness means to be in a right relationship with God. To be in a right relationship with God. That means that righteousness allows us to stand before God without him condemning us or without we condemning ourselves. So when we stand before God in righteousness, he does not condemn us and we don't condemn ourselves. And you'll find that many times in the Old Testament, people were afraid of the presence of God because they were unfit. Without righteousness, when we stand before the Lord, we stand in fear and we stand in shame, just like Adam and Eve when they had sinned. They, they were afraid of the presence of the Lord and were hiding from God. Because without righteousness, the presence of God becomes terrifying. The presence of God becomes a fearful place. But when we are righteous, we come before God without fear. Now, these are just two uh, uh, definitions of righteousness, they don't cover the whole breadth of righteousness, but it gives you sufficient. 
So if righteousness means that God examines us and uh, passes us, or that we have right standing before God, then righteousness is very high. And ordinarily, uh, none of us will be examined by God and, and God will pass us. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. When God starts examining you, uh, he examines your thoughts, he examines your intentions, he examines things you have done, things you haven't done, things you should have done, things you shouldn't have done, uh, the omission, commission, uh, the, the, what he's looking for is so much that somewhere he will find fault with you. So righteousness uh, is, is a standard that is very difficult to attain to. Almost impossible to attain to by ourselves. But that is the standard. This is God's level and he examines us by his standard. And in our own right, we cannot fulfill righteousness. So that leads me to my second important point that there are two kinds of righteousness in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Two kinds of righteousness. And I will explain them very soon. But let's read two verses that will help us to see these two kinds of righteousness or two ways of attaining to righteousness. The first one is in Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. And if you know anything about Philippians chapter 3, the apostle Paul talks about all his credentials and says that they amounted to nothing. Uh, and then the second one is in Romans chapter 10 verses 1 to 3. So I'll start with Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. And he says, be found, and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God. Now, I want you to underline or highlight in your Bible my own righteousness, my own righteousness, and then highlight righteousness which is from God. My own righteousness, righteousness which is from God. Highlight it or underline it in your Bible, whichever Bible you use. If you're not using any Bible, then jump on the screen and highlight it on the screen. That's for those of you who bring no Bible to church for whatever bizarre reason that you don't bring Bibles to church in any form. Okay, Romans chapter 10 verses 1 to 3. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 to 3. I want you to listen to this very carefully. It says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Once again, in verse 3 of this uh, Romans chapter 10, highlight or underline God's righteousness and then their own righteousness. So if you look at uh, these two passages we read about, there are two kinds of righteousness that uh, the Apostle Paul talks about two kinds of righteousness. The first kind of righteousness is what is, he calls our own righteousness. Our own righteousness. It is a relationship with God based on faith in our own good works. So we know that God's standard of righteousness is so high and, and we say, well, we want to meet God's standard and we're going to do it by trying our possible best. We're going to do it by doing our best. And, and so uh, our own righteousness is when we want to relate to God based on our own good works. And so Paul says to the early believers, some of them, that they were trying to establish their own righteousness. And the reason why people want to establish their own righteousness is because they want to have a righteousness and, and brag about it and say, look at me. 
I am this and I am that and I've done this and I fulfill God's standard. God's standard is high, but I have met it. So, it is a righteousness that is based on our own effort. And Paul called our own righteousness or those who are seeking their own righteousness as pursuing with zeal without knowledge. They are zealous about it. They are eager to be good people, but they are ignorant people. So, trying to establish your own righteousness is a sign of spiritual ignorance. It is zeal without knowledge. Zeal without knowledge is a fervent desire among the Jews to please God, to obey the law. That is the kind of uh, Jew that Paul was until he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had zeal to do the right thing, but he was not knowledgeable. And Paul says that lack of knowledge is that we are ignorant of God's righteousness, which I will talk about pretty soon. But this is how Paul himself uh, identified himself in Philippians chapter 3 from verse 5. He says, circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I counted loss for Christ. So, our own righteousness, no matter how hard we try, no matter how blameless we live our lives. You know, there are people who go through life and say, as for me, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't want to offend anybody. I want to live a perfect life. It's great to desire. You have zeal to be a perfect person, but the Bible calls it zeal without knowledge. Ignorant, zealous Christian. You're zealous, you're doing your best, but it's ignorant. Why is it ignorant? Because God has offered a way for us to be righteous. And that is the second kind of righteousness that the Bible talks about. God's righteousness. God's righteousness. A relationship with God based on faith in Christ Jesus. This righteousness does not come from us. It comes from God. He gives it to us. Not because we've tried so hard. But because he's done everything for us. So we have our own righteousness. God's own righteousness. Our own righteousness is our effort to please God. God's righteousness is God's grace reaching out to us. And we receive it as a gift from God. The righteousness of God is not earned. It is received. He initiates the process. He offers it to us. And all we do is receive it by faith. That is why in the New Testament... Righteousness is not an accomplishment. Righteousness is a gift. It's not a reward. It's a gift. Salvation makes us righteous. But the righteousness doesn't mean that all of a sudden you become a perfect person, which you know you are not. That righteousness is not based on you. It is based on God. And what Jesus Christ did for us. That foundation must be drummed in our head. Because if we don't do that, we would have zeal for God, but without knowledge. You know, so uh, sometimes when you hear Christians talk about who is acceptable to God and who is not acceptable to God, they judge it based on so many things. Look at the hairstyle. Ah, did you see her fingernails? Do you think with these fingernails you go to heaven? And you know, many times they hit the women. And look at your face. You've painted your face colors. You will not go to heaven. It is zeal. 
but without knowledge. Because we don't go to heaven based on our hairstyle or finger paint. We go to heaven only on one basis alone. The grace of God. What Jesus Christ accomplished for us on the cross of Calvary. And we receive his grace freely given to us. And that is what makes us righteous. You know, but people like it, especially when preachers preach and are hitting hard at people's behavior. And the people say, Bohobium, hit it again. And we hit at people, and you are this, and you've done that, and you are that, and look at your dress, and look at your hair, and look at your nose, and look at your ears, and look at that, and you've pierced your ear ten times, and, and uh, do you think God will love you? You may say that it is not modest. You may say it is inappropriate. You may say it's not a good example, but you can never use that as the basis of righteousness. That is what we call zeal without knowledge. And there is a lot of zealous preaching that goes on without knowledge. Because it does not acknowledge what Christ has done for us. So how does Christ make us righteous? How does he make us righteous? Two ways. The first way he makes us righteous is through substitution. Substitution. Substitution is a very big theological word. Substitution. And substitution is captured in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. He says, for he, the first he, is God Almighty. For God made him, the second him is Jesus. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. It's called substitution. Why do we say substitution? It means, it, we say substitution because Christ took our sin upon himself. He did not commit sin. He did not become a sinner. But he took our sin upon himself. Another theological word. His, his, our sin was imputed to him. Imputed to him accounted to him. He did not commit it, but it was added to his account. It's like somebody who did not borrow the money, but the money has been added to his account. So, Jesus committed no sin. Jesus did not become a sinner. Jesus did not become sinful. But our sin was put on him, was imputed on him, not his own sin. So the Bible says, he who knew no sin, he who knew no sin, became sin for us. Why? So that we can take on his righteousness. So Christ took our sin upon himself and we took on Christ's righteousness. Did he commit sin to be a sinner, uh, to, to take our sin? No. In the same way, we don't commit righteousness to be made righteous. He who knew no sin became sin so that those who knew no righteousness can be made righteous. It is the divine exchange. He took our filthy garment and wore it for us. And he took his righteous garment and put it on us. So when you are going with that garment of righteousness, it is not your own. It is a gift given to you by Christ. That's why the Bible says, lest any man should boast. 
that oh, I am righteous because I'm self-disciplined. I'm righteous because I came from a good home. I came from a good family. It's good to be self-disciplined and come from a good home. But your righteousness has nothing to do with your home or your upbringing. It all has to do with Christ Jesus putting his garment on us. It's called substitution. He substituted us. He stood in our place with our sin upon him. And we stood in his place with his righteousness upon us. On the cross, there was an exchange. The sinful received the gift of righteousness. And the righteous bore the sin of the sinful. And in that, Christ became the giver of righteousness. Any righteousness that does not exalt Christ is zeal without knowledge. And it, you have to be attention to that because, you know, our ears like certain kinds of preaching. Our ears. We like condemnatory preaching. We like a preacher who stands on the pulpit and condemns everybody and blasts everybody and gives it to everybody. And talks about all kinds of things. We love it. But that is zeal without knowledge. Because the righteousness of God is not a product of zeal without knowledge. The righteousness of God comes through the substitution of Christ. He became sin, so we will become righteous. The second way that Christ makes us righteous is through sacrifice. Through sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 20. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now, this small passage, I, let me just give you a little background to it. You see, under the Old Testament, God dwelt in the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies. The Ark of the Covenant was, was in the Holy of Holies. And on top of the Ark of the Covenant was something called the Mercy Seat. And on top of the Mercy Seat was what was called the Shekinah. Or the Shekinah. The cloud. The light. The glory of God. In the Holy of Holies. Between the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies. And the second chamber that is called the Holy Place. There is a veil. And that veil prevented people from going into the presence of God. So the Israelites knew God lives in a place we can't get to. It doesn't mean God was in the Holy of Holies. It's just to remind them you can't approach him. There is a curtain between you and God. There is a division. But what Hebrews is saying is that Jesus Christ penetrated that curtain. How does, did he do it? By offering his body. So his body then was like the veil, the curtain. So when his body was crucified and was beaten, the curtain was open. And on the day that Jesus died, it was symbolized by the curtain in the temple opening. Although the temple at that time did not have the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. It symbolized that the body of Jesus has opened the way for us. So when Jesus Christ died, not only did he take our sin, but he opened the way to God so that we can stand before God without any form of shame and condemnation. We can be the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We come not in our own name, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So through sacrifice, Jesus did it for us. The blood of Jesus gives us right standing with God. 
We have a relationship of boldness with God. No fear. No inferiority complex. We are not worms and maggots before God. We are sons and daughters of God. We are his and he is ours. And when God looks us at us, he sees us in Christ. That is the only reason why he receives us. The sacrifice of Christ, the sacrifice of his body, the sacrifice of his blood opened a new way to God. This is how we become righteous. This morning before we take communion, if you are here and you don't know Christ as your righteousness. You know, sometimes people sit in church for a very long time without being born again. People can be church members for 10 years, 20 years, but they're not born again. Why? Because while they are going to church, they, their mind still thinks, I have to do all the right things so that God will accept me. If I can only be a good person, I will go to heaven. You know, these days, you know, when somebody passes, you know, a lot of people uh, put that on Facebook and, and, and you read comments people make, oh, he was a good man, you go to a good place. He's a good woman, you go to a good place, you have rest. For your information, death does not take everybody to the same destination. And it is possible for your loved one whom you loved to go to hell. It can be somebody who was a celebrity everybody loved can go to hell. Just because somebody is nice, could we just, oh, he was such a good man, God will receive him. If God was receiving our goodness, nobody will qualify. Because Isaiah says, all our righteousness is like filthy rags before God. Your best effort is like rags. The best effort of any good person, whether from Mother Teresa to whoever, the best effort is filthy rags. So if you think your father, your mother, your brother, yourself has audience with God because you are such a good man, you are zealous without knowledge. The way to salvation is through the gift of righteousness which Christ gives. So if you come to church here and you say, if I can go to ICGC, I will, I, God will accept me. Or if I can go and hear uh, Pastor Otabel, then I have salvation or I have righteousness. You are a joker. So this morning before we partake of communion, if you are here and you have not accepted the free gift of salvation and righteousness in Christ. I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that before we partake of communion. So you eat communion as a righteous person and eat blessing upon yourself. So let's bow down our heads for a minute. And if you are here, you say, Pastor, I want Jesus to come into my heart. I want to receive the gift of righteousness. Just lift up your right hand wherever you are. Lift up your hand. Don't feel shy. Don't say, oh, everybody will see that I've been coming to church for a long time. Uh, and now I'm lifting up my hand. Lift up your hand. Because salvation is an individual choice. I see some hands up. If you're in the balcony outside, ushers, take note of those with your hands up. Because we're not going to call anybody forward. But take note of them. Though, just lift up your hand. And those of you with your hand up, I want you to put that hand you lifted up upon your chest. Put your hand upon your chest. And we're going to pray this prayer to receive Christ Jesus into our hearts. And all of us will pray. But for those of you who lifted up your hand, I want you to pray it with deep meaning in your heart. Are you ready to receive the gift of salvation? 
and the gift of righteousness. Put your hand upon your chest and pray this prayer with me. Everybody is praying this prayer. Say with me, Heavenly Father, I come to you today just as I am. I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. But I thank you, Father, that Jesus died for me on the cross of Calvary. He took my place. He took my sin. So today, I receive his righteousness. I receive his gift of salvation. Because of Jesus, I wear today the garment of righteousness. Clothe me, Heavenly Father, with your righteousness. Make me acceptable before you. I thank you, Father, for accepting me today. In Jesus' name, amen.